On a desolate island, a skeleton clad in a checkered shirt emerged from the depths. The remains washed ashore on Spencer Island with little to no clues, carrying with it a dark secret that has eluded investigators for decades. The sheriff's office assumed that it was a cold case and buried the body. 44 years later, the man would speak from the grave and identify himself. Welcome back to True Crime Expresso, where we delve into the world's most captivating accounts of solved and unsolved crimes and brooding mysteries from all corners of the planet. Join us as we uncover the shocking and twisted details of this cold case 44 years in the making. We'll explore the chilling mystery of Gary Lee Haney, a case that was seemingly lost in time until now. In the late 70s, amidst the rapidly growing suburban landscape of Marysville, Washington, an eerie tale unfolds on the edges of Spencer Island. This idyllic spot, renowned for its mesmerizing array of shorebirds and waterfowl, became the unlikely setting for a chilling incident that would forever grip the community. As the locals flocked to the island, seeking solace in the serenity of birdwatching, a seemingly unsuspecting duck hunter ventured into this paradise unaware of the horror that awaited him. It was on the crisp morning of January 3, 1979. It had been a week of below zero temperatures and it was the first time that the air felt slightly warmer. Amidst the piercing cold of the winter of 1979, a duck hunter ventured out into the desolate abyss desperate for a catch. Little did he know, fate had a different surprise in store. Emerging from the depths, he saw something that almost looked unreal a ghastly sight materialized before his eyes. A ghoul-like skeleton, similar to a Halloween decoration, tragically ensnared in a tangled web of fishing line, haunted the desolate tide flats of the enigmatic island. A peculiar ensemble of items lay together in the Snohomish River Delta by a 12-foot wooden piling, a shoe, a leg bone, and a tan pair of pants. The hunter's attention was then drawn to a red checkered shirt near a fallen cedar, which led to the shocking reveal of a skull, ribs, and another black leather shoe with a foot inside. The scene was nothing short of a bone-chilling mystery waiting to be unraveled. He quickly reported it to the police. Officers on the case spotted the red, orange, gray, and white checkered shirt. Lying five feet away was a human skull and a shoe with the foot still inside. Keeping all these grotesque details in mind, they also located a 33 to 34 size belt with a pair of laced shoes size 8. The shoes had the O'Sullivan logo printed on the rubber heels. The tag on the khaki washed out pants read that it was made in USA. These findings were vital details to the identification of the man. His leather wallet was found as well, but any money or identification had been washed off. It seemed the owner had been dead for months. The sheriff's office recorded him as John Doe 79-1, as per the coroner's case number, was 79-1-7. The cause of death could not be determined due to the decomposed state of the skeletal remains. There were no dental records that proved to be a match at the time. A couple of months later, on March 15, 1979, the body was laid to rest by the Cassidy Funeral Home at Cypress Lawn Cemetery. Back then, since there wasn't much technology to go on, unidentified corpses were often buried. In the present day, the medical examiner's office stores human remains until they are identified or claimed. But back then, DNA technology wasn't as advanced. There was no hope of identifying this body, especially when nobody was claimed missing in the area. As the years passed on, the priority to identify the body grew less of a priority. It wasn't long. The case grew cold and was forgotten. In 2008, emerged a team that began to re-examine unsolved or unidentified cases of Snohomish County. Advancements in DNA technologies helped solve many such cases. The team wanted to exhume the remains of the deceased, hoping to find and identify the person using DNA samples. However, the entire process can take years as the paperwork for obtaining permits and the testing itself is quite extensive and time-consuming. The nameless person lay in a slumber, undisturbed by all that was going on above ground. Finally, after many years and paperwork, in July 2015, the remains were exhumed from Cypress Lawn under the authority of Snohomish County Sheriff's Office team and the Medical Examiner's Office. After being transferred to the Medical Examiner's Office, it was renamed Spencer Island Doe. 
By the end of July 2015, Forensic odontologist Dr. Kyle Tanaka had taken dental radiographs and charted the unnamed person's teeth and uploaded the data to NCIC, National Crime Information Center, and NAMUS, hoping to get a match for dental identification. NCIC is the FBI's computerized index that stretches across crimes and missing person cases, allowing law enforcement personnel without jurisdiction in other areas of the country to get a match for their victim or potential suspects. Yet it was fruitless. There was simply no match for this unidentified body's teeth. Forensic artist Natalie Murray, who excelled in her field, was assigned on the case. It was April 2016, and within a month, the artist successfully took measurements and photographs and reconstructed the face in the form of drawings and sketches, basing her image on facial morphology to give an idea of what the person looked like in life. Natalie reconstructed the face by attaching rubber pegs to the skull in all the missing parts. She then speculated how he would have looked. His narrow nose and flat cheeks seemed consistent with people of Asian descent. After all the estimates, she drew him from the shoulders up, wearing the same checkered red shirt to visualize him at the time of his disappearance. The general idea was to have someone identify the face by looking at the sketch. That same month, Dr. Kathy Taylor of Washington State Forensic Anthropologist at the King County ME office examined these remains and revealed that they possibly belonged to a Caucasian adult male between 5 foot 2 and 5 foot 6 feet tall, and possibly anywhere from 21 to 61 years of age. There was no trauma to the bones, but there was a badly healed femur fracture on the leg. The femur is actually the biggest bone in your body. The use of an x-ray revealed that the middle third portion of his body was sticking out like the claw of an ice scraper indicating that the man would have experienced chronic pain. Detective Sharp commented that they had never seen a fracture heal in such a way, which led them to speculate that the man may have avoided medical help altogether or lived in a third world country with limited access to medical care. Jane Jorgensen, an investigator at the medical examiner's office, was left puzzled by the situation, as there were no clear answers. Even if the man was homeless at the time of his death, it seems unlikely that he would not have sought immediate medical care, which is provided for free in many countries. It begs the question, why did this man suffer in silence with such excruciating pain? Furthermore, the man was missing two left anterior top teeth and two molars, which appeared to have been lost prior to his death as the sockets had healed properly. Additionally, it was found he had a gap in his teeth and three teeth with alloy fillings which suggested that the man had sought out medical care at some point, leaving investigators to wonder why he had not gotten urgent attention for his leg. The detectives were left with a sense of confusion and uncertainty regarding the circumstances surrounding the man's life and ultimate demise. Had he been a victim of torture? Officers also noticed that he could have been a prisoner, as inmates have access to dental care. But even if, theoretically, he was missing teeth and had a limp, why wouldn't anyone remember this man? The fracture would have made this person walk around with a limp and possibly two inches shorter on one side. A retired officer from the 1970s recalled seeing a man limp around the late 70s in town, but he couldn't recall his name. This opened possibilities for medical records, but the age ambiguity was a large one. He could have been a fisherman, and perhaps he had either drowned or his seamates had given him a sea burial. This section of the femur was sent to the University of North Texas Health Sciences Center, UNTHSC, in September 2018. It was further tested for DNA extraction and uploaded to the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, CODIS, which is a database that helps identify samples based on forensic genealogy. The year after, in March 2019, the university managed to get mitochondrial DNA and STR images, yet it was an inconclusive find because there were no matches. But the office did not give up. It just meant they had to find other modes or methods of identification. Between 2018 and 2021, the investigators of Snohomish County Medical Examiner's Office eliminated several missing persons as potential matches using a combination of factors including circumstances, STR testing, and dental records. However, in 2021, they initiated a partnership with Othram Inc. to create an advanced DNA profile that could be used for investigative genetic genealogy to solve their outstanding cold cases. 
As a result of this collaboration, several previously unsolved cases have been successfully resolved through identification. By January of 2021, a section from the femur was sent to Othram Inc. for DNA extraction. The entire project was funded by DNAsolves.com in hopes that the technology available would finally result in the Spencer Island dough to be revealed. In terms, it was like reducing the search from 1,000 to 100 people, far easier to list down potential descendants. In May 2021, the obtained DNA was sufficient for forensic-grade genome sequencing and a DNA profile was successfully generated. It was confirmed the person was Caucasian. The same process is used for anyone looking for long-lost relatives and figuring out their own genealogy. From many top matches, investigating officers built ancestor trees and found a male who was missing in Everett, Washington in late 70s. The Spencer Island Doe was finally identified. His name was Gary Lee Haney. The 29-year-old had gone missing in the late 70s, but he was either not reported missing or the records had been bungled up. Either way, based on the DNA reference of his half-sister, the skeletal remains finally had a name. On February 10, 2023, the chief medical examiner officially announced the descendant as Gary Lee Haney. After 44 years, the cold case was finally laid to rest. Gary Joseph Condomati was born on September 23, 1950, to mother Bernice Schaefer. She got divorced when Gary was young and remarried in 1955 to an Air Force officer named Sheldon Lee Haney. The stepfather adopted Gary and even changed his middle name legally. From Topeka, Kansas, this young man was able to travel the world with his parents. Gary loved the Beatles, and it was stated he could play the piano very well with his eyes closed. Gary's cousin, Hal Thane, who was 71 years old, helped piece together various memories and information about Gary's life. He kept records of the family that stretched around the country. A few black and white photographs showed the dark-haired Gary holding a big dog's leash or cradling a cocker spaniel puppy named Taffy. His mother is with him in a beautiful dress with a sharply dressed stepfather. There is even a school picture in the photographs painting the life the boy must have led. The family moved from Kansas to New York. Annually, the relatives got together to visit the cemetery, but the Haneys were always away somewhere else. Thane vaguely recalls that Gary had some sort of mental disorder as he behaved slightly differently. Perhaps it was autism, but the boy actively hallucinated in adulthood, which could be due to schizophrenia. When Gary was 16 years old, his biological father, Joseph Condamati, died at Missouri Veterans Hospital. Only three years later, his mother died. Gary Haney never met any of his half-brothers or sisters. With his real parents gone, his stepfather also finished his military service and went to work as a commercial pilot for Boeing. Sheldon Lee Haney lived in Everett, Washington area from the early 1970s until at least 1990. Since he was the only living family member Gary had, it is possible he lived with his stepfather at some point. After retirement, Sheldon Haney lived like somewhat of a migratory bird. He enjoyed going to Baja, California in Mexico by road during winters. Perhaps it was too cold for the man, but it's clear that he didn't have much responsibility. Could it be that Gary was independent by then? Thane recalls his uncle visited him in Texas sometime during the mid-80s. He never mentioned or spoke about Gary with his nephew. Some records indicate that Gary was living in a boarding house and that Social Security indicated that he died on Christmas Eve 1976. However, that information is questionable because no living relative listed him as deceased. It's speculated that perhaps Sheldon and Gary had a falling out or he moved out on his own account. Whatever the case, Sheldon Haney lost track of his adult stepson. Recent investigators who investigated the case found no missing person report but it should be noted that the paper record-keeping during the time was not as meticulous as it is today. Therefore, it is possible that the records were lost before they could be digitized. Sheldon Haney died in 1997 with no knowledge of his stepson's whereabouts. Despite thorough investigation after all these years, no clear indication of foul play could be discerned. Based on their investigations, it was surmised that Gary had possibly been swept away by the river current and had eventually ended up at the confluence of steamboat and union sloughs. Alternatively, he may have met his end by drowning near the spot where he was found, lost in the muddy waters. As to the actual cause of death, that remains as a shroud of mystery in itself, with the potential causes ranging from drowning to a head injury or a medical condition. Aside from the childhood photographs, 
Hal Fane has no idea what his cousin looked like as a grown-up. He has said he felt a pull to the gravesite and intends to put up a marker or gravestone on the burial site. 44 years of twists and turns and still, it seems the answers to this case has opened up even more questions. What were the circumstances under which Gary died? There were no established cause of death, no clue. Buried alone without his family, at least the Spencer Island Doe has a name and some form of closure. What do you think about this thriller of a case? Let us know your thoughts down below.